Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Welcome back to another episode of the Shared Teaching Podcast. I'm your host, Susan, the creator behind Shared Teaching. And today you are listening to episode number 28, where we are talking about how to organize your classroom library. Now, this episode is going to be a little bit different. I am going to start doing one podcast episode a week that happens to also be a blog post. So what I have been doing is separate, so a blog post and then a separate podcast episode, and it's getting to be a little bit too much, especially as I'm about ready to start back into the school year. So I am going to do just a podcast episode that happens to have a blog post with it. So when you go to my website, sharedteaching.com, you can view not only the podcast episode and listen to it, but you can also see the corresponding pictures that have to do with what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and dive in. So when we're talking about organizing our classroom library, we want to first think about how we're going to organize our library. So today I'm sharing with you what works well in my own classroom, but I do encourage you to spend the time reflecting on what you want your own classroom library to look like and how your students will be using it, because this is the step that makes organization work. Now, currently, I am using almost the same system of organization that I used during my first few years of teaching. It's always worked well for me, so I decided, hey, why and reinvent the wheel? Plus, I'm not a big fan of changing things up in my classroom all the time. I think because I spend so much time reflecting and kind of hemming and hawing over my choices in the first place, that to change them just kind of seems like way too much effort. So the first thing I always like to do before I'm embarking on a new project is to search Pinterest to get some classroom library organization ideas. So Pinterest is a wonderful way to kind of ooh and ah over some beautiful photographs of classroom libraries that you might be envying. So it's Pinterest is one of my favorite ways to get new classroom ideas and just kind of get inspired. And my favorite classroom libraries are the ones that are just very simple and inviting. They seem very homey. I'm always envious of the teachers that have the bright white shelves and the matching book bins, but this is not my current reality. I actually have the old metal shelves that the school gives me, and you know, it works. Would I love to have beautiful new shelves? Well, of course, but as a single mom, I just can't justify the expense of purchasing multiple sets of bookcases for my classroom when the school has provided me perfectly working ones, even if they're kind of (laughs) ugly. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with spending your money to purchase things like that because we spend so much time in our classrooms that we want to be comfortable and feel happy about our spaces. But just over the years, I've spent a lot of money on my own classroom, and now that I have my daughter to care for, I'm a little bit more mindful of how I'm spending my money. So if you're like me, you can still have a beautiful library space without spending a ton of money. It can happen, especially if you're a new teacher. I know it's very hard to look at all these beautiful different pictures of classrooms and really want to go all out and have something just like that. But just remember, it can take years to get to the point where you see a lot of bloggers are at. Okay, so now that you've kind of looked through Pinterest and chosen some ideas, you want to really 
zone in on your organization method. So what I like to do is I like to think about how my library is going to be used, and that's going to help me figure out how I'm going to organize it. So right now, and for a long time, my classroom has been organized by genre and topics. Many of the topics also tend to fit a genre category. So for example, if I have a tub that's books about plants, it might say plants on the label, but it also has a subtitle on it of nonfiction because I want students to just not think of it's books about plants, but I want them to realize, okay, a plant book most likely is a nonfiction book, and it's starting to kind of give them an idea of those genres. So now my first few years of teaching, I organized primarily by topics like animals and sports, and I taught first grade at that time. After moving to second grade, I decided it was important to begin front-loading their knowledge of genres and move to having genre labels, which is what I now have. So predominantly, my library is organized into fiction and nonfiction. So I took this one step further and I placed all my fiction books into colorful bins that I had purchased many, many years ago at Dollar Tree. Now they don't sell them anymore, And surprisingly, after over 10 years, they've held up really well. A few cracks here and there from, you know, being in the heat, because I usually live in a desert, and it was sitting in my garage for a long time while I taught overseas. So there are some cracks in some of them, and so I've had to get rid of a few because they're just a little dangerous to have some plastic cracking in there, and I don't want any kids cut. And then I have plastic shoe boxes. So I just have those very basic clear plastic shoe boxes and I found them at the dollar store again. I found them at Walmart. I found them at Target. A lot of times during back to school season for the college students, they usually have them in big packs. So maybe like a pack of five or six, you can buy a group of shoe box tubs and they usually have pretty colored lids. So I just remove the lids and those are actually just stacked in my cabinet at school and I just use the bottom of the shoebox. And then I really like having this idea of separate bins for fiction and nonfiction because it's yet one another way students can easily look at the library and know what kind of book they're reading. And it also helps them put it away. So they know if it has a black label, it's going in the nonfiction side. And if it has a gray label, it's going in the fiction side. So I also color code it that way. Now, because I had some cracked bins and I've lost a few over the years, I don't have enough to have my whole library in nice, colorful tubs. So that's also why I did the clear shoe boxes and the colored shoe boxes. And if you're anything like me, I have tons more nonfiction books. So I have a lot more that I need to keep buying. And it's really easy to find the clear plastic shoe boxes versus trying to match the colored bins. Now, because second graders are still getting used to the idea of genres and figuring out which bins belong where, or sorry, which books belong where, I also have dedicated several bins that are just for specific topics. So there might be bins on class favorites, favorite authors such as Mo Williams or Dr. Seuss. And then I have bins that are for our favorite author series. Now, I don't tend to have a ton of books. I wish I did, but I just don't. So in the author series, I might have um, several books by Patricia Polacco, and that might be in a bin by itself. I have a lot of Robert Munch books. I love his books, especially for mentor texts for writing. I use those a lot. So those are by author series. So then when we read a series of authors and we get used to their style and maybe their illustrations and we talk about those through mentor texts, the kids can easily find them in the bin labeled author series. So now we've decided how we're going to organize our library, and you want next you want to decide how the students are going to browse and borrow the books. So it's not enough to just think about like, hey, 
hey, I think genres are really cute. Let me go that way. But now you also want to think about how are students actually using your class library. So where are you going to place the library to show that it's important to you? Do you have space somewhere in your room to do this? I've seen a lot of teachers that place their library that kind of frames their teaching area. So they have a large classroom rug, and along the edges of the rug, they've placed their bookshelves for their library. And then they sit inside the frame of the library shelves to kind of have their class meetings and their mini lessons. Now, personally, I have a super small classroom, and I do not have enough room for a classroom rug let alone a designated teaching spot, which means usually I stand at the front of the whiteboard to teach. And it also means that my library has to be placed along the wall somewhere. But I do tend to put the shelves parallel to each other to kind of give a little cozy niche. And before COVID, I had inexpensive bathroom rugs that I had purchased. And you can find some really cute, cozy ones at Ikea, super cost effective. Also at um, Target or Walmart, just really small bathroom rugs, big enough for one kid's bottom. (laughs) And I just threw two of those into my library reading area because that's really all the space I have. And then along the wall, I threw a bunch of pillows that I got on clearance at Ikea. I love Ikea if you can't tell. So that's kind of how I set up my classroom library to make it kind of cozy and a nice place to lounge and read a book during center's time. So I'm also quite particular with how my books are treated and cared for. So at the beginning of the school year, no one is allowed to check out books from the library until we've gone through the daily five lessons about book rules. So how to choose a book, best fit books, how to take care of our books. We're not allowed to touch the library books in my classroom until we've gone through those lessons. So usually kids are, you know, like they're like, oh, I really want to. And so it kind of gets them excited to be in the classroom library because they know it's, you know, it's very important. We really have to take care of it. And I make it a big deal because that's how I was raised to to take care of books. My mom wanted to be a librarian. She went and got her master's for it. So I really take that to heart, and we spent a lot of time in the library growing up. So I like to instill that in my students as well. So after we go through the Daily Five book rules, maybe, you know, we just spend a week on it, then students are finally allowed into the library. (laughs) They're allowed to freely browse and read books during center rotations, but then I ask that the books are returned to their location at the end of the rotation. Now, many books suffer damage when students just shove them inside their desks or take them home, and I know I might be polarizing a lot of people here right now, (laughs) and you might be like, oh my gosh, she doesn't let them take the books. But I'm just trying to be honest. You know, I spent a lot of money and a lot of time and many, many years curating these books for my classroom. And the idea of them getting bent and torn and ripped up, it just, it hurts my heart. And yes, kids need books. And yes, they may not have them at home, but they have plenty of time with the books. Okay, so they have their center rotation. And then they also have a book bag, which is just a large plastic gallon Ziploc baggie that holds several leveled books, and they keep those in their desk throughout the week. So if they are not in a library center rotation, they can pull those out and have read to self time with their book bags. They also get to go to the library, and my school lets them check out two books every week, so they have the school library books they can look at as well. And then most of my classroom library books are actually picture books and easy readers because remember I was in first grade for a long time with ELL students. So their knowledge and their ability to read was quite low for first grade. So I built my library based on their needs. And now that I'm in second, I'm kind of working on trying to get a little bit more challenging books, some easy chapter books. So I don't currently have books where students need more than one time period or one center rotation to read the book. 
So that's also why I don't allow them to keep them in the desk because they're very short books. They can read really quickly. And then they often choose multiple books in a setting while they're in centers. And they just don't need to keep them and keep reading them, if that makes sense. Okay, so while you're thinking about how they're going to browse and borrow the books, whether you agree with me or not, come up with something that works for you that you feel comfortable with, because that's how you're going to make sure to stick with the classroom management side of it. If you pick a system that you thought looked cute on someone else's blog or on a Pinterest pin and it doesn't work for you, you're not going to stay consistent with it. And then the students aren't going to be consistent with it either. So pick something that resonates with you that you know that you're going to enjoy and try. And it's okay if you try something and you figure out, you know what, now that the kids are using these books, this system just doesn't work for me. And then feel free to like swap it out and try again. Christmas break is always a really good time to reset and have kids come in with a new system. So keep that in mind. If you can hold off till Christmas, winter break, if you want to call it that, then that's a good time to reset and kind of have a do-over. Okay, so you want a consistent checkout system for books if you're allowing your kids to check out the books. When students visit the classroom library on their center rotation, I have a small amount of long laminated bookmarks. So the idea of these bookmarks came from the school librarian I had at my very first teaching job. She gave each student in the library a paint stick that she picked up from, I don't know, Lowe's or Home Depot. And I think now they offer them for purchase. They don't just give them for free anymore. (laughs) But she would give every student that came to the library that was browsing for books a paint stick. And then they placed that paint stick on the bookshelf in place of the book that they removed to look at. Then they could easily find their paint stick, put the book back in, and it didn't mess up the library organization too much. So I adopted this same idea and I just simply glued two pieces of colored paper together and I did that because I wanted a long bookmark that was longer than an eight and a half and 11 sheet of paper. So I just simply made it long enough so that it would stick up out of my book bin labels. And then the students would put them in the book bin while they removed a book, looked at the book, read the book, and then they could find their bookmark and stick it back in easily. Now, I no longer do that because I added matching stickers now to the front covers of all my books, and the stickers match the book bin labels. So students just need to look at the sticker picture, find the matching bin picture, and they know exactly where they go. So my challenge now is just to make sure that the students are putting the books in facing the same direction. So one's not upside down and backwards. And so, you know, there's always something, right? So now if you decide to label just the spines of your books and completely do away with book bins, you might want to keep this idea of the paint stick or a bookmark to hold a student's place while they're getting a book, especially if you teach first or second grade. I think they just really need that extra reinforcement of, okay, this is where I took the book out, this is where I'm putting it in, because seeing rows of books with just the spines can be a little overwhelming to our younger students. So if you're teaching older students, then they can probably do it no problem, but just be mindful that those younger students might just need a little extra support. Now, after a few months, you could gradually release the use of the bookmarks, and then students can really start focusing on how exactly your classroom library is organized and how to put the books back correctly. So if you're allowing students to check out books, you want to make sure that you have an idea of how to track which student has checked out which book if that's important to you. I've never personally done this because like I said, they don't leave the 
classroom and they don't keep them overnight. So I don't really need a checkout system. But if you're allowing students to take books home or they're staying in their desk for several days if they're reading a chapter book, then you want to have a system for tracking the books because they might inevitably get lost or they traded with another student and you just want to keep track of them. So an oldie but goodie is to place library pockets and a card inside each book and have students sign their name and date they took it on the card. Now this can be time consuming if you have a lot of books to keep track of and you have a lot of library pockets to have to put in them. And also, I remember from my days, this is how the library actually worked when I was little, those cards fall out a lot. You know, maybe you hold the book upside down and it falls right out. So the cards can fall out, they can become misplaced. So it's not super ideal with young students. So another way to track the books is to have a binder with a simple table that you just make in, you know, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, whichever one floats your boat. And it'll work much the same as a bathroom sign-out sheet. So students just write the title of the book, their name, the date they borrowed it. Now, again, if you're teaching early elementary, this can be a little challenging, especially with students copying the name of the book. And if you have more than one student checking out a book, it might take a long time, and then there might be a line of students waiting to sign out their books. So the easiest idea I have seen is by Courtney of Teaching in Paradise, and I've linked to her blog post where she talks about this in my podcast episode page. So you want to make sure you check out the show notes so you can link and see that. And she simply just snaps a picture on her phone of the student holding up the books that they want to borrow. And then when they return the books, she just goes and deletes the picture. So super simple. She can just take a quick picture. It's on her phone. Kids aren't writing anything down. She's not writing anything down. Very easy to take care of. Okay. So if you liked this episode, I also have some matching classroom library labels, so you can look at them on the podcast episode page as well. And then I want to know, how are you organizing your dream classroom library? What's the system that works best for you? I would love it if you would share it and leave a comment, because I know other teachers would love to hear as well and get some inspiration from you. So thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you next time. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching, hitting that subscribe button, and leaving us a review on iTunes, so we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on shareteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Share Teaching Podcast.